I'd like to welcome you to another portrait painting and demonstration. And as you've noticed for the past couple uploads, I'm starting to use a much more classical approach, a much more strategic approach. So I'd like to share with you how to paint classical portraits. Drawing is the first and perhaps the most important element in classical painting, as I've mentioned several times before. So we are working on an 11 by 14 inch linen canvas, and I'm drawing directly onto the canvas with a B lead graphite pencil. So what I'm looking for is just the basic placement, uh, that is the basic composition of the painting. Now the most difficult thing when it comes to drawing directly onto the canvas is the fact that you have to get your composition pretty much perfect from the get-go. As you saw, I was measuring from one point to the other point, um, from the furthest extremity to the left and furthest extremity to the right with the placement of the head, just to make sure that the head is not in any kind of uh, awkward angle. Uh, with the composition. Now, I would recommend doing a transfer drawing on a separate sheet of paper. That would have been um, the better decision, but I was kind of in a hurry, so I decided to just draw directly onto the canvas. Now, as you're seeing, we started off with the outside shape, and now we're working outside shape to inside shape, constantly checking angles. This is a kind of slow, methodical way of looking for accuracy in a drawing without uh, tracing. So I'm just using comparative measurement. I'm just relating each angle to each subsequent angle, each shape to each subsequent shape. And as you're seeing, I'm constantly using the pencil just to draw little imaginary lines to further relate areas to one another. Now I did mention doing a transfer drawing would probably be the easiest, but that's going to be a topic for, say, another video. So with this, we're just focusing on the contours, and though we went through it quite quickly, I did spend a long time on the outlines, trying to get the outlines as crystal clean as possible. Now we're going to build the values. This is, in fact, the next day that I worked on this painting. As you're seeing here, I'm using a medium that medium is Venetian medium, and we're using titanium white and burnt umber. So what I'm trying to do now is build the forms. And as you can tell, I've kind of been using this uh, smaller palette. I do prefer handheld palettes. I feel like it connects the artist to the artwork a little more than using a glass palette. So. What I'm trying to do is work from the darkest darks outward. Usually, if I want to work very quickly, I'll work in the middle tones out with a tone surface. But since we're building our way from the white, you're seeing here, we're starting to pick, uh, say, the darkest area. Say that's the darkest of the concavity of the eye socket to the left of your screen. And then with our little value web that you're seeing develop on the palette there, we're slowly moving our way around the forms. Now, the most important thing is to make sure not to make the surface too dark right away, especially when you're going to be layering a painting. So this painting is going to have a couple more layers after this. So when you're building up the values and you're building up your underpainting, it's important to make it as light as possible because when you layer color, it is much easier to layer darker colors onto a lighter ground. Now, for those of you that are new to portrait painting, I highly recommend this technique, the more classical technique to learning how to paint portraits as opposed to starting right away with the alla prima. Alla prima is fine. It's a, it's a way to practice. It's a way to build your paint handling abilities. Um, and again, if you're new to painting, I'll explain what alla prima means. Alla prima means painting uh, wet on wet. So that is going into the canvas with straight paint. 
and it's a perfect way to create a quick painting. Uh, but if your your goal is to create more of a classical realist painting, then this would be the approach that you would want to use. Now, as far as the strategy is concerned, we're focusing on the main triangle. This is usually something that I look for, uh, especially when I'm drawing or painting um, like a human head. So the two eyes and the nose, and just because the eyes are the most difficult things to move, uh, because they're fairly complex uh, relative to say everything else the nose is the second most complex thing uh, to move around the mouth being easier to move around than the nose makes it less of an important area to look for in the beginning so as i said this is a a way to strategize the painting just like in uh, the previous upload to this one I mentioned a strategy for success. So this is a much safer way than that video, um, the one where we went directly in with uh, black and white paint and built our underpainting in that way. This is much safer if you have your outlines as um, precise as possible. Now there were some mistakes in the, the drawing and you'll see um, how I will measure it and correct it later on in the video. But it's important to have those contours as accurate as you can possibly make them. Now, as I'm mixing the color on the palette, I am using a little bit of my uh, turpentine that I had. Now, turpentine is the thinner that uh, people don't like to use because of the, the odor that it has. I don't particularly dislike the odor. Um, but the reason I'm using turpentine is because the medium that I have, Venetian medium, has a little bit of turpentine in it. So it just kind of made sense to use it as the thinner. And with the first layer, this underpainting layer, it's okay if the, um, if the paint mixes with the graphite, as you saw on the top of the forehead. That's perfectly fine, since we're going to go over it again. Uh, with subsequent layers so it's okay now fat over lean i know i'm moving kind of quickly so uh, pretty soon i'm going to slow down the narration speed but let me just explain the fat over lean principle because i know that this is kind of important when it comes to layering oil paintings just think of it this way you want each layer to dry faster than the subsequent layers so you want to paint in a way that the first layer will dry completely. You don't want to paint over a layer that is still in the middle of drying. Mind you, oil paintings do take uh, a significantly long time to be completely dry, quote unquote completely dry. But all the fat over lean principle means is you want to use more and more medium as you continue to layer the painting. So as a result, you want to also use colors that will dry faster in your initial layers or say in your underpainting. So in this underpainting, that's why I chose the burnt umber because the burnt umber again will dry very quickly. And with the Venetian medium that I'm using, it is a fast dryer. I'm going to use more and more of it, mixing it directly into the um, mixtures of color as the layers develop. Now in terms of the building of the planes of the face, this is the portion of the video where I will start to slow down my narration because I know I, I tend to talk kind of quickly. So now we're gonna slow down the narration. And remember, slowing down my narration doesn't mean I will stop talking. It just means that I'm slowing down the rate of words per minute. You know what I mean? Um, so with the large planes, in particular right here around the, um, the cheekbone 
going towards the mouth, uh, the zygomatic bone going towards the orbicularis area. I'm actually making it very light, very bright, and painting rather thin. I used quite a bit of the uh, turpentine to thin out the paint. And I'm leaving the lights pretty much flat with some of these half tones around the side. And then I'll go in, when I go in with color, I will add more and more specificity to the values. But this way, I'm just laying down a ground that's incredibly light that will allow me to work in more transparent layers later. And now that all of the light shapes of the face are covered, uh, I actually ended up losing the footage for covering uh, the background and the hair and the neck. So the important thing is the understanding of the contours and then the filling in of the lights for the face. The rest would have been repetition anyway. So now we're going to jump into the next stage which is going to be what I'm going to call this time triple checking the drawing. So I went over all of the proportions just optically comparing just using a little caliper here and I found that the eye uh, to the left of the screen is a little close to the right and that was the only major thing that I found. So now let's move on to the local color stage of this classical painting. Now I've added some more colors to the palette. So it's just flake white, titanium white, burnt umber, alizarin permanent, cadmium red, yellow ochre, and ivory black. Later on you'll see that I end up adding sap green and ultramarine blue later, but I'm keeping these colors extremely simplified. Now as I mentioned earlier, I said that the eyes are the most difficult things to move, but try as we will we do the most that we possibly can and then we have to move an eye that's just the way these things work um, i measured it as much as i could but i ended up making a mistake and the mistake was i don't think any more than a millimeter so i'm using a small brush in fact this is the brush i'm going to use for uh, painting in the lights of the face anyway so i started with the tear duct i moved the tear duct a little bit to the left so pretty much the width of a brush stroke of a brush this small is the adjustment that I'm going to make for the eye. So starting off with that tear duct, I then proceed to moving the eye. And again, it's going to be very imperceptible uh, to the eye how much I had to move these structures. It wasn't really that much. Now with the flesh tones, I am using a little bit more of the burnt umber in the middle tones with the flake white. So my major flesh tone colors involved yellow ochre and cadmium red to give me kind of an orangey hue and then cadmium red and then titanium white to give me a kind of pinkish hue. So I'll be balancing between the pinkish and the orangeyish colors. As I usually mention, when you're working with photo references, it is much more difficult uh, to paint a naturalistic looking portrait than it is when you're working from a live model. I always say I prefer to work from life and I still stand by that, but due to limitations, we can't always work from life. So with the photo reference, I made note that the colors the flesh colors seemed washed out in the photograph. I took the best photograph I possibly can. I didn't edit it or anything like that. Um, but the flesh tones on the photo reference seem kind of washed out. So if you're watching this and you're painting along, uh, perhaps in the Facebook group, just be careful with the um, how cool the flesh tones are on the face. 
it can be very uh, tricky to balance uh, the flesh tones and make them look, um, should I say, more alive and less cold because the flesh tones in the photograph look cold because the color uh, was washed out a little bit. So you're noticing a pattern with how I'm building the color on the face. In fact, it's the same as how I developed the tones for the underpainting. Started off with the darkest darks and then moving my way with the exception of the tear duct, the correction that I had to make earlier. But when it comes to modeling of the forms, I'm working from the darks up. And then in the final layer, I will start to use uh, glazes to complete the, uh, the painting. Now, classical painting, or should I say classical realism, takes quite a while to develop. This is much slower than um, working in the alla prima way. Alla prima, I already defined earlier, um, but as you know, it's the way that I did most of my portrait paintings for the YouTube channel. It is only recently now that I'm starting to move into more uh, quote unquote realistic paintings. So if you're also making a similar transition uh, into making more uh, classical realist paintings, I highly suggest mo working, excuse me, working on multiple paintings at a time because from each layer, so from the underpainting, I waited a couple days, and then after this layer is dry, I'm going to wait a couple days, and then between each layer, there's going to be a gap of a couple days, and in that gap, it is recommended to have a couple still lives or a couple other, um, you know, a couple other portrait paintings or figure paintings that you're working on, or even preparatory drawings, which is what I'm currently doing, uh, is making drawings in order to prepare for paintings. Now, this is all part of the classical approach to creating paintings, which I think is, uh, it produces, at least for me, and this is all relative, but for me, it produces more visually compelling work than um, if I were to just jump into it with paint in a direct painting fashion. So now you're seeing I'm using the cadmium red into the uh, colors for the palette. I do apologize with the um, handheld palette. You can't see the colors as uh, closely as you could with the glass palette, but I figure with classical painting, I want to show you as close to the real experience as possible. So that's why I'm using a handheld palette now. A little bit of the cadmium red and the alizarin permanent mixed into the middle tones, the middle flesh tones is what's allowing me to create the uh, dark warmish tone for the tear ducts of the eyes. And in terms of the flesh tones, with the first pass, I'm really concerned here, as you're seeing, with drawing. See there, I'm checking to make sure that the movement or the, the motion that I made with the eye was correct. Now, I'm not trying to make it perfect like the photograph. I'm not trying to make it perfectly photographic. But after being away from the painting for a couple of days, I just noticed that it looked kind of strange that the eyes were too close to one another. So I was losing kind of some of the likeness in that way. And now it just mixed yellow ochre and ivory black and a little bit of the Venetian medium into the, uh, the iris. So the color of the iris is kind of a neutral greenish blue. So that's what I'm using to create the color for the iris. And as I wrote earlier in the video, this photo reference, you will have access to it in the Facebook photo reference group. And the link for that will be in the description box down below. But you can just go on YouTube and type Upari 
reference photo group and you should be able to find it. And now I'm going to slow down the rate of narration a little bit. Now, there's one thing I mentioned a couple episodes ago, learning how to see. And I don't mean literally learning how to see, like how to see sunshine or, or trees or anything like that. Learning how to see is learning how to give it your all with the form modeling. So that's what I'm trying to do here give it my all with the form modeling, trying to make the forms as realistic as possible, knowing in the back of my mind that I may miss some things. Uh, so I give myself that opportunity to come back into the painting. Uh, so building the middle stages of the painting within multiple days, uh, I can do that by learning how to, how to see and learning how to search for planes that are turning away from the light, uh, colors that vary from one another in one day, and then whatever I missed in that one day, I pick up where I left off the next time I work on the painting. So in that way, you're not so limited to trying to develop a fully finished painting in a single day. That's the beauty of classical painting, is that you can work on it as a long-term project, and then the end result ends up becoming that much stronger. Now remember, in the underpainting, I mentioned that I would leave the lighter lights of the face pretty much just flat, very light and very flat. And that was so that with this layer, the, um, the local color layer, mind you, local color, uh, this stage of the painting can be done in multiple layers, in multiple uh multiple weeks. And I, I suggest that, I highly suggest that you spend more than one layer uh, building these tones. Now what I was trying to get at was I left the lights very flat so that now as you're seeing I'm going in with a little bit more of a transparent mixture of color to build the tones very very methodically but not methodically to the extent that it's a painstaking process. So that's another aspect of classical painting that most people think, uh, at least I, what I've read or heard, mo most people think that they don't have the patience for it. And I did think that in the past, um, admittingly. It's not any less patient to build a painting in this way. In my opinion, this does kind of eliminate, not completely, but it mostly eliminates the awkward stage. Do you remember in the older videos I would mention the awkward stage, uh, how things would look kind of uneasy? That uneasiness happens when the drawing, I suspect it happens when the drawing is not as refined, but when you go in with a more refined drawing like this, it's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. Um, analogy, though you end up spending a long time planning out the painting, the end result of trying to create the best painting you possibly can actually ends up taking less time because you don't spend so much time trying to 
correct the mistakes that you may have made by going into the painting right away and then trying to complete it that way. And the rapid movement of the brush that you're seeing there is the way that I make the edges softer between planes. So I'm almost cross-hatching with the brush strokes in order to make the transitions between forms softer. Now I mixed up the yellow ochre and ivory black with a little bit of medium. Then I went in with a little bit of the cadmium red uh, mixing complementary colors to create a kind of uh, neutral greenish tone for the shadow. And typically in classical painting, you want the shadows to be very quiet, almost like another dimension, meaning you don't want to put too much modeling in the shadows. But I decided to put in some indications of the, uh, the neck muscle, the uh, sternocleidomastoid, and now we're putting in some of the lights for the bottom of the neck. Working our way all the way down to the clavicles. And with the local color stage that we're in now, as mentioned before, as you're seeing, I'm only making it a tad bit darker than it was in the underpainting. So still not making it as light as it can possibly go, with the exception of the shirt. The shirt, I'm using titanium white and a little bit of the ivory black and some of the Venetian medium. And the shirt, I'm just making it really light without making it completely uh, titanium white. and with a little bit of a cooler touch for the cast shadow, the shadow that's being projected from the hair. And now with the ivory black, a lizard and permanent, and burnt umber, we're starting to mix the darkest accent for the hair. A little bit of turpentine. Starting off with the darkest accent for the hair, and now very rapidly, as you're seeing, the hair is already covered. And now it's just a kind of muted green color for the background. And we're going to let this dry for a couple days. But I actually, in fact, let it dry. After this stage, I will let it dry for an entire week. And one week later we're going to return to the same exact stage building the color so i consider this local color stage so as an end result the painting i don't end up finishing it uh, to the extent that i wanted to finish it as i did wait a week for the painting to dry so that's why i'm calling this layer now building the color so we are still in um, say the local color stage but now as we start to build color there's going to be more depth in the tones and more contrast within the hue variations so as you're seeing i have the same colors on the palette with the addition of the sap green and the ultramarine blue in between the yellow ochre and the ivory black and what i'm doing is i'm remixing the flesh tones that i had in the first pass, I did intend to build the colors within multiple layers, but I ended up running out of time for this painting. But nonetheless, now you're seeing how um, we're gonna start to develop the forms. And another thing that I didn't do uh, between uh, last week, so when I was working on this painting the week prior to this session, what I didn't do was oil out. Instead, I let the um, the colors kind of fade 
into the canvas instead of going in and adding oil or medium everywhere. So um, again, I'm working from the darks moving on outwards. And the purpose for this part of the uh, development of this painting is to further specify the edge quality of the painting. So I'm actually trying to make edges softer and sharper where I feel they need to vary. And the palette I'm using, I did change into that larger palette. So usually around the um, the ending stages of a painting, I tend to switch to this larger palette. It's a Turtlewood brand palette. Again, I really am a fan of uh, painter's palettes. But in any case, it's Turtlewood brand palette, not the type of wood. This isn't made out of turtles or anything. It's the name of the brand, Turtlewood palettes. And I'm starting with a light glaze on the eye to the right. And so by glazing, I'm just using a very a balanced mixture of uh, Venetian medium and turpentine to thin out the paint. It's as if it was a stained glass layer, very thin layer of color. And you can actually build your halftone through thin glazes. And with, when you're glazing, you don't want to paint over uh, the values that you had before. You're only slightly tinting the colors. And when you're glazing, you also want to take note of what colors you're using to glaze. So I'm using a little bit more of the lake reds in the glaze mixture. So the lake reds, meaning the alizarin, whether it's alizarin crimson or alizarin crimson permanent. For this purpose, it's not as critical. So if you have alizarin crimson, the... Um, the one that doesn't say permanent on the tube, it'll be fine. Uh, as you glaze on these colors, it will look the same. The only reason that, um, at least to my knowledge, the only reason the they have an alizarin permanent now is because alizarin crimson historically has been described as a fugitive color. I could be getting that wrong, so if I got that wrong, feel free to correct me. Now I'm going in each small little area, I'm going to each small little area, just like I was building up the layers before. As you're noticing, the pattern is repetitive in nature, going from the eyes to the nose, the mouth, and then the large areas of the face. And you can continue working in that cycle for, again, multiple layers. Now you have a close-up of exactly what I'm doing with the edge work. Keep in mind the camera is at an angle with respect to the canvas. As you're seeing the side of the canvas there, the camera is at an angle so that I can paint without a camera in front of my face.
Now these transitions are almost impossible to see. Um, this is more of a conceptual thing that's going on here. So if if you're on my Patreon, uh, one of the uh, mentor tier critiques, you may know, uh, if you're watching this, you may know uh, that I'm talking directly to you. Um, in the mentor critique, I mentioned that the transitions in the modeling phase of a painting are almost imperceptible to the eye. This is what I meant when I was writing the uh, mentor tier critique. This transition is almost impossible to see, and the way I'm applying the transition is through thin glazes now. Through glazing, I'm able to obtain a type of rendering to the form that wouldn't be as easily attained if I were working uh, wet on wet. And I highly suggest uh, using either Neo McGilp, which is a product from Gamblin, or using Liquin. So Neo McGilp, which is Gamblin's, Liquin, which is uh, Winter and Newton's, or this one I, I recommend the most currently, Venetian Medium, which is Rublev's version, or Rublev's Medium, sorry. The medium that you use to glaze is very important, and the way you balance medium to thinner to paint is also very important. But another nice thing about glazing uh, is that you don't have to cover the entire face. So that's one thing that I'm always asked is how do you glaze and tint the entire color of the face? And the answer is you don't have to do that. You can glaze within smaller areas of the face just as you would be developing, um, you know, the flesh tones if you were painting wet on wet with the benefit that you can wipe things out if you don't like the glaze that you added. And now you're seeing that I'm starting to push a little more depth into the side plane of the nose. So when you're layering, you want to vary, you want to know where to vary um, the opacity and transparency with your paint. That doesn't have to be an exacting science, um, but for the nose, the side of the nose, I painted a little bit more opaque just to try to uh, flatten the shape, meaning I didn't want as many brush strokes to show through. So there you, you're seeing I'm kind of cross hatching with the brush strokes. And then in the same exact way as you saw in the uh, the first layer of color, I'm going to now build my way around the entire face in the same way. Again, it's it's repetitive, but being repetitive actually makes it a little bit easier to uh, understand the process, in my opinion, because you know exactly what you're looking for and you know exactly how you're looking for it, which means uh, those subdivisions of those planes, but now working in thinner glazes as we develop these colors. And again, the flesh tones are pretty much the same um, as what you saw 
earlier with the smaller palette. Remember that smaller palette was intended to show you more of the flesh tone mixtures. The larger palette is intended to make my life a little bit easier knowing that I had already shown you um, what colors I used to mix before. So it's just easier for me to use that larger palette than the smaller one. But the smaller one is easier for me to show you what colors I had mixed. And again, I do recommend you do this in multiple layers to develop even more specificity to the planes of the face. Glazing a little bit more pink in this area. Just trying to make the edges very, very refined at this point. And even with the neck, I added a slight glaze using the sap green and a little bit of alizarin permanent. And then we're going to do the same exact thing and make the edges much more specific for the neck. And now one final little coat for the background. As I mentioned before, I intended to add more layers to this painting, um, more glazes, but I ran out of time. The painting wasn't completely dry, but it's okay. You can still see um, the development of classical painting, even though I didn't finish the painting to the extent that I wanted to. You're able to see uh, with more clarity how this process is unfolded and there you have it i really hope that this week's episode helps you out i wish you the best in all of your artwork remember if you would like to have access to this photo reference just check out the facebook photo reference group if you would like to support this channel even more i have a patreon account if you would like to see more painting videos such as this one please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I wish you the best, and I'll see you on the next episode.